All right, gentlemen, we are going to um, finish off World War II in this presentation. Um, when we last left off in Europe, and we'll go ahead and get the war completed in Europe, and then we'll go over and finish uh, the war in the Pacific. In Europe, we left off. We had successfully invaded on D-Day, and we had a narrow hold on the coast of France. Um, <clears throat> Now, while we were successful in landing on the beaches on D-Day, and as I said um, in the other uh, presentation, you know, over 120,000 men had hit the beaches by the end of the first day. Thousands of paratroopers were scattered behind enemy lines um, or were linking up with invasion troops, whatever. Moving beyond the beaches into France was very difficult. Um, and that is because of a, uh, a bit of unique geography or terrain surrounding uh, the Normandy beaches. The, the problem with uh, northern France, uh, Normandy, is that they had a habit of marking their fields, uh, marking property boundaries with hedgerows. Uh, basically, you, you build a, a mound of dirt and you plant some shrubs, hedges, and those will grow, and those will eventually uh, do what a fence normally would do. It's basically a fence that you don't build. It just is a fence that grows. Um, here you go. So this is an actual aerial photograph of the Norm of, of you know in the Normandy area from 1944. Okay. And for those of you who are like, oh, that's not bad. And then you get down on the ground and you see what they actually look like. You know, like what, what going down this road right through here would have looked like. Um, and that's what this is. You know, every one of these is like this. Um, it's several feet tall. It's taller than a man. Um, in some areas, a little thicker than most. And it is perfect for defense. It's perfect for ambush. You know, if you think about it, if you're the Germans... Um, you put a team here, you ambush the Americans that are coming down this road. They call in some artillery and stuff. You guys run away and reposition up here and get them again and run away. I mean, it's it's the worst game of hide-and-go-seek ever if you're the Americans. And that's what you have to fight through, mile after mile after mile. And so we landed successfully in Normandy, but we didn't make much progress um, until finally on July 25th. Uh, almost a month after we had successfully landed in Normandy. Um, <clears throat> actually, more than a month after we had landed in Normandy. We landed in June. Um, and finally, the Americans just carpet-bombed an area. We It was called Operation Cobra. Um, we sent 2,500 bombers, and we just blew a gap. Um, several miles wide, many miles deep, and then we just drove the American army through it. I, I mean, we just obliterated this chunk of France and because we, we knew of no other way to get through that. Once we got out the hedgerows, it was game on. Um, once we broke out of the hedgerows and got into the French countryside, um, the French population obviously eagerly helped us, most of them, not all, but most. Um, the French resistance, as it was known, and um, basically, German German resistance collapsed, and we liberated Paris on August twenty fifth. Um, so we got from basically in one month. Let me try and get to the map. In one month, we got from here to here. Basically, um, once once we got out of the hedgerows, it was pretty swift. We just moved. By the way, we made an invasion of southern France several weeks after Normandy. It was a smaller one. But the Germans knew that their time in France was was numbered. Um, once we got uh, once we captured Paris, we actually very quickly raced through the remainder, and within a matter of weeks, by early September, we were actually um, not too far from the German border. So in a couple of months, we had liberated all of France. Um, we had entered Belgium. Uh, we were knocking on the doorstep of Germany. Okay, by the end of the summer, um, or by late summer. Now, winter was closing in, and as we've talked about in our class, armies are 
um, reluctant to go to war in winter, um, to, to do anything in winter. It's hard to supply, even in the modern day age, even in World War II in the 1940s. Winter is a pain. Just ask the Germans. <laughs> Had it not been for winter, they would have been in, in Moscow. Um, and so also you have to realize, too, as the American army raced across France, right, once we, once we broke through, all the supplies to support these troops have to come from bases in England. So you've got to truck them across the English Channel and then drive them to the front lines. Most of the railroads have been destroyed by either American bombers previously or by the Germans as they retreated. There was a supply issue. So the American army was actually struggling to get supplies. Um, the winter was coming. Nobody wanted to attack in winter. So basically the American army and the British army um, were kind of preparing to settle in on the border and finish this thing come the spring. You know, they were they and the Russians were kind of content to just dig in and wait for springtime to come. Um, but the Germans decided uh, they would roll the dice. One, They had enough left over for one last attack. Um, and so the Germans decided to throw everything in, into one last attack. Um, their goal was to take the port of Antwerp. The Americans and British had actually recently captured Antwerp up here. Um, and we're planning to use that as a base to deliver supplies. Basically, instead of delivering the supplies through here, they could deliver them, shortcut them here. That would help out. The Germans had this crazy idea that they would drive through here, take a sharp right-hand turn, capture Antwerp, destroy the American and British supply lines, throw our armies into chaos. We would retreat. We would quit. There's a lot of belief that the um, the Germans had lost kind of touch with reality at this point, and were like convinced that they could somehow pull off this miracle. Um, but the German plan is to drive through the Arden Forest once again. Um, man, the Germans really love this forest. The same area where they launched their their attack to trap us, well, to trap the British and the French at Dunkirk early in the war. The Germans decided yet again to launch an offensive out of the Arden Forest. Um, and to then, as I said, drive towards Antwerp, take Antwerp, um, and, and destroy our, our newly established supply line, um, or supply base, I should say. Um, as you can see here, this was what the Germans were hoping to accomplish. Um, this is what they accomplished, not near what they were hoping to do. It's called the Battle of the Bulge. Um, it's called the Battle of the Bulge because it created a small bulge in the line for a few weeks. That's it. Um, it did not create this epic, you know, thrust into the heart of the American and British lines. Um, instead it just kind of, eh, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, it caused chaos, units were captured, units were forced to retreat, um, it was embarrassing for both sides, and I kind of miss. I'm sorry, when I was pointing up here, um, Antwerp is more like right around here, it's not quite that far up there, but anyhow, um, Yes, it was bad, but it wasn't the end of the world. Uh, the Allies were taken by complete surprise. The weather was terrible. Um, it was, I'm not going to call it blizzard, but it was close to blizzard. It was horribly snow-covered. No one expected an attack, much less an enemy that was just dying, right? I mean, the Germans were on their last leg. In 1944, the Germans had gone from here to there, practically on their border. Um, by December of 1944, I mean, they are on the border. Um, the Russians are knocking on the front door, or on the back door, I should say. And the Allies have made it to their border. Um, Germany is on her last leg. Her air force has been basically annihilated. Um, matter of fact, they're going to throw what's left of their air, for their air force into this attack. Um, they, they don't really have the resources for this, but they did it anyhow. Um, they surrounded American troops at the, uh, at the town of Bastogne. Um, down here. Actually, you'll see it better on this next one. Uh, this is where the 101st Airborne paratroopers were sent in. Not as paratroopers. They literally rode trucks to defend the city and found that they got surrounded by the Germans right as they got there, basically. And when they were told to surrender, their commander famously just replied with nuts. Um, and, you know, it's this epic stand by the 101st Airborne. Um, 
And basically, this was a failure for the Germans. Within a couple of weeks, the Allies had retaken all this ground and drove the Germans right back to where they started. Um, really, the worst thing is if you're the Germans, you lost men and tanks and aircraft and stuff you will never replace. Um, as, as your book mentioned, they lost 100,000 casualties, a bunch of tanks and aircraft, and they really have nothing left. Uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, there's nothing the Germans can throw at the Americans and the British to stop them. Um, while we are, you know, taking care of this business, meanwhile in the East, that's where the real fire is coming from. Uh, the Russians are coming for revenge. <laughs> uh, remember Barbarossa, remember what you did to the Russians, Germany, well, you're about to get payback. Um, in 1944, as you can see, um, in early 19, or excuse me, in early 1945, from January 1st to um, May, uh, to the end of the war. Here you go. So from January 1st um, through March, they basically drive through the remainder of Poland. Uh, they cross the border into Germany. You know, by February, um, Soviet troops had reached the Oder River. They were only 35 miles from Berlin as early as February. Um, and the Germans fought, I mean, desperately to stop the Russian advance. Uh, the last obstacle in the way of the Americans was the Rhine River on, on the western um, border. The western border between Germany and France is the Rhine River. Um, unfortunately for the Germans, we were able to capture a bridge over the Rhine River here at a place called Remagen on march 7th we started pouring across the river at the same time the russians are pouring in from the east um as i have up here by you know the uh end of march um the soviets are just outside of the capital city of berlin um actually on april 21st their artillery began to hit um, the, the, the suburbs of Berlin. So by late April, um, Russian artillery is falling in the capital city of Berlin. By this time, Adolf Hitler, actually long before now, Adolf Hitler had retreated to his, his bunker under the Reich Chancellery, Chance, Chancellery building in downtown Berlin. Um, and he had been there for several weeks. And he knew the end was coming, and he did not want to be captured, and he had lost all touch with reality. Um, for those of you who, are, who have seen all of the various Hitler reaction videos that have been made uh, in this world, um, those are all videos that use a clip from a movie called Downfall, which was a movie that was made in Germany. It's, it's actually in German, hence the subtitles that you get to play with. And... Um, it is based on an actual outburst that Adolf Hitler had when Adolf Hitler basically was told that there was not going to be a counter. He was planning this counterattack to like drive the, the Russians away um, with this unit led by a General Steiner. And, uh, you know, and he's got like this this vision of all these like, like it's Blitzkrieg back in the day. And, and that's why his aides are like Steiner is not able to attack. He doesn't have fuel and, and he goes in an outburst. And that was kind of when he basically announced to everyone he had no intention to surrender. Um, he had no intention to leave Berlin. He was going to die there. Um, he was going to take his own life. Um, on April 30th, he, first of all, um, married his longtime girlfriend, sort of. It's a weird thing to explain, but we'll just call her his girlfriend. Um, he married his, his, his longtime sweetheart, girlfriend, love interest, uh, a woman by the name of Ava Braum. They got married in a little civil ceremony down there in the bunker, and everybody had a little champagne. And then they went to their bedroom, and they committed suicide. Um, Adolf Hitler uh, put a gun in his mouth and shot himself in the head. Ava Braum took a cyanide capsule and poisoned herself. Um they then took Hitler's body outside the bunker, doused it in what little bit of kerosene they had available, and burned the body. Um, that was something Hitler wanted. He did not want his body captured. Um, Mussolini, Mussolini's body was put on display after Mussolini was killed by Italian partisans. Adolf Hitler did not want that fate, and he certainly did not want the, the Russians having a chance to put his dead body on display. Um, so he committed suicide, and he had his body destroyed. 
Before killing himself, Hitler named the leader of the Kriegsmarine, um, the German Navy, Admiral Karl Dernitz, to take control of Nazi Germany. Dernitz tried to surrender to the Americans and the British. It's a weird story, but for quite some time, the Germans had been... Um, They'd been convinced that they could convince the Americans and the British to um, basically stop the war and let the Germans fight uh, the communists. Or maybe even all three of them could tag up and fight the communists. Um, they were, they like a lot of the world, understood that the relationship between England, the United States, and the Soviets didn't make a whole lot of sense if you took Germany out of the equation. And it's what actually we'll learn about in Chapter 26, the Cold War. Um, how the United States is supposed to be friends with totalitarian Joseph Stalin dictator, I murder my own people, Soviet Union. Yeah, I mean, once you once you end the threat of World War II, there's no reason for us to be dating anymore, so to speak. So the Nazis were trying to play that. They were basically offering to stop fighting the British and the Americans, and in return they would be able to throw everything they had to stop Stalin and the Russians and communism. But we were all committed to ending the war as a team. Um, that was one of the things that we had said at the, at the Tehran conference and other meetings. Um, there will be no separate pieces. It will be unconditional surrender. Finally, um, with the Soviets literally swarming through the streets of Berlin, um, Karl Dernitz ordered or offered the surrender, the unconditional surrender. On May the 7th, Nazi Germany surrendered. And the next day, May 8th, will be forever known as VE Day, Victory in Europe. Um, the war in Europe is over, um, officially. Uh, the surrender signed on May the 7th. Um, but v, uh, May 8th, considered VE Day because it was the first day that the war in Europe was actually over. Unfortunately for President Roosevelt, he never got to see VE Day. Um, President Roosevelt died on April 12th uh, while vacationing in Warren Springs, Georgia, um, the place that he actually went to recover after his initial um, bout with polio. Um, he was there with some friends and uh, was actually getting a portrait done and suddenly kind of reached up to touch his head and he said i have a horrible headache and that was it um he had a massive stroke and died his vice president harry truman became president obviously at that time um so unfortunately for fdr he he made it almost to the very end of world war ii um he died only a couple weeks before adolf hitler did and before the war in europe ended harry truman for those of you who are wondering had just recently become president or vice president, I should say. Um, he was not the original vice president for FDR. Uh, Roosevelt's original vice president basically had come to oppose some of the president's policies in World War II. They had a bit of a falling out, and he was not on the ticket in '44. So Harry Truman is new to this job. Harry Truman had not been vice president this whole time. He actually had only been vice president of a couple months at this point. Um, he really had only been in the in the inner circle and inner workings of the executive branch for a few months, so he's he's really an unknown quantity. Um, felt quite overwhelmed. Uh, he inherited quite the situation, but before um, he's able to end the whole war, we you know the war in Europe is basically wrapped up by the time he takes um, the reins. But the war in the Pacific still got about six months to go or so. Um, not quite six months. So now let's let's pick up in the Pacific. We last left off. We had successfully invaded the Philippines, right? I mean, obviously the turning point midway Guadalcanal. We've been slowly, steadily driving the Japanese back. You know, we talked about the story of like you know the lessons, the brutal lessons learned at Tarawa, and we eventually captured the Marianas to build our B twenty nine bases. Um, we talked about the Japanese turning to the desperation of kamikaze attacks to try and turn the tide. Um, interestingly, you know, those B-29 bases, we got them in operation pretty quick. Um, we took the Mariana Islands and we started building B-20. We took these islands in June and July, August. Um, by October, these bases were ready to go. And by November... 
um, B-29s were ready for missions all the way to Tokyo. And so on November 24, 1944, uh, B-29s flew and bombed Tokyo. The first time since Jimmy Doolittle, if you remember way back, Jimmy Doolittle in April of 1942, the Doolittle raid, when a handful of B-25s dropped like 50 bombs, you know, little little nothing on Japan. Um, here we are, November of 1944, 80 B-29 Super Fortresses fly over 1,500 miles from their brand new air base to go drop bombs on Tokyo and fly all the way back. These early B-29 raids did very little damage. Um, there were several problems, but before we go on, I will show you really quickly. Hang on a second. Just because we're not at school doesn't mean we can't use one of our favorite applications. Um, old Google Earth. So, you want to know where the B-29 bases were? Here they were, in the Marianas Islands. So here's Guam, America's tropical paradise. Um, so, for example, Tinian Island. There was a base in Tinian Island. There it is. It's no longer in use. World War II was a long time ago, but that is what is remains, or the, the you know, the rotting remains of a B-29 base um, from World War II on Tinian Island. Um, There was a, another one on Rota, I think. Can't, yeah, oh, that one's really overgrown. Um, some of the remains, and they've, they've rebuilt. But anyhow, Tinian, um, which will come back up in a moment. But there you go. There's one of the B-29 bases. So all the way from this little island, this little speck here, they would fly all the way across the ocean to go bomb Japan. The problem is that's a long way to go, and there's no way to make sure you're going in the right way, really. Okay? Um, you know, if you're off by just a fraction of a degree on your compass, right? Um, you know, you start doing the math and you think about it. If you're off just one fraction of one degree, um, you're going to miss your target by a number of miles, um, by a wide margin. And the problem is these planes were going basically as far as they could go to do this. We were pushing it. Um, they were flying basically as far as they possibly could. They don't have spare gas to go look for their target if they get lost. And again, there's no way to, to check if you're on course because there's nothing to look at. You're flying over ocean. A couple little specks. And like, let's be honest, if you're supposed to be flying through this little gap here, and you don't see any islands, you have to assume you're on the right course. You can't know that you're actually over here. Um, wind could blow you off course. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. And so these, these planes, many of them missed their target. By the time they got to Japan, they didn't have enough fuel to fix it, and so they just had to drop their bombs. Well, the answer became two things. One... If we had a way to help the B-29s navigate, like if there was a way for them to make sure they were on course, like let's say we actually had control of something in between their bases in Japan, like a radio beacon or something for them to fly to, that would shorten how far they had to fly without navigation. Secondly, if there was a place that after they bombed, if they really were running low on gas, they could land, that would be great too. And that is why the Americans began to decide we needed to go to Iwo Jima, this little scrap. Um, Iwo Jima is a small volcanic island. Um, I say that because it is really the result of this volcano. Um, I wonder, I wonder how, how good our 3D is. Um, not half bad. So... You can tell that there's a little mountain here. That is Mount Suribachi. That is a volcano. This island is basically the result of over the millennia um, eruptions, lava flows. There you go. There's not a whole lot there to talk about. Um, it is a small island in the Pacific. Here's, here's another. This is just a volcano, basically. Uh, that's not Iwo Jima, but you know, all that is is just these are just volcanoes that pop up. And create islands. If we could build an airbase there, that would solve our problem. Um, first of all, we could put a navigation beacon. The planes could fly to the navigation beacon, basically just home in on the radio source, um, and then from there fly to their target. And they would fly. It's halfway, basically. So we would dramatically reduce the navigation errors. Build an airbase there, 
planes that are running low on gas could land there instead of having to worry about, you know, not being able to make it all the way back to base. Um, this was a horrible, horrible island to attack, though. Um, for one, the Japanese had learned the valuable lessons um, of previous battles where they would put all their eggs, so to speak, in, in, on, in one basket. They would defend the beaches. And as soon as we took the beaches, it was game over, right? Um, like Tarawa. It was bloody. It was awful. It was three days, though. Uh, because once we had punched through the beach defenses, there was nothing left to do. Later on, the Japanese adopted a new technique, a tactic. Um, there's no way I will successfully get this on the... Oh, wow. Did I actually do it? So here. Here's an example. Um, no, that's not it. There was another island. Here it is. Actually, Pillar. So, and if you watch the movie Pacific, not the movie, the series I mentioned about Marines in World War II, this island was a great example. Yes, the beaches were awful, but the Japanese actually invested a lot of defense further inland. So the Marines not only had to take the beach, they had to fight all over the place. And, you know, the Japanese were hiding in the hills and in the valleys and in caves. And basically more Marines died taking the interior of the island than taking the beaches. The Japanese did that at Iwo Jima. Yes, they defended the beaches some, um, but they actually, you know, for example, they dug a cave network um, inside of Mount Suribachi. There were all these volcanic caves they took advantage of, and they made bunkers, and they just made it this horrible, horrible fight. 60,000 Marines landed on Iwo Jima. First thing they found out, um, it's a volcanic ash island. It is like the finest sand you can imagine. Um, I've never been to Iwo Jima, obviously, but I do think I can give it some comparison to if anyone has been to Destin, or the area right around Destin, Emerald Coast section of Florida. If you've ever been there, it's the finest sand you can find. It's, it's the finest sand beach in America. Um, and anyone who's been there will tell you, walking on it is exhausting because you just sink. There's no traction. Um, that was Iwo Jima. The Marines found that crawling through that sand, you couldn't dig a foxhole. You know, you couldn't dig cover. You couldn't hide. Um, you couldn't make progress. It was just horrible. It was this fine dirt that offered no protection um, and, and was just horrible to try and move around in. And it, it just was a bloodbath. The Marines, gentlemen, um, they also, because the, the enemy was dug in and hiding in bunkers and caves and tunnels, um, they had to use flamethrowers and explosives. The Japanese loved to basically let the Marines pass by and then attack them during the night after they thought they were safe. Um, more than 6,800 Marines were killed before Iwo Jima was finally captured. It took a month to take control of that island. Um, Iwo Jima, though, does give us one of the most famous images of all of World War II, the flag raising atop Mount Suribachi, right? Um, one of the most iconic photos in all of American history, but particularly of World War II. Um, after we took Iwo Jima... Um, your book mentions, before I get to this next one, um, it wasn't long after Iwo Jima that the man in charge of our B-29s decided it was time for a different strategy. High-altitude precision bombing wasn't working. Um, turns out that what we, the technology we had was great, but there were just certain things you couldn't factor in. Um, wind. There was no way for the bombers to know what the wind was like over top their target. Um, so there was no way to account for that, right? And, you know, you might not think about it, but a bomb falling 23,000 feet, getting hit by a crosswind, it's going to blow that bomb off target by, you know, maybe maybe a couple hundred yards. And you blow a hole in the ground, not in a factory. Um you know, there were there were just certain things that the, the technology that we had could not overcome, and it made bombing actually less accurate than we wanted. And so we were dropping a lot of bombs and only hitting a fraction of our targets. Um, I, I, you know, there's all kinds of numbers and studies and whatnot, but let's just go ahead and say one in ten bombs hit it to hit its target, and that's being generous, honestly. 
But let's just say that. We're dropping a lot of bombs, not blowing a lot of stuff up. And that's when the commander um, in charge of our B-29s, Curtis LeMay, um, he said, all right, new plan. We're going to fly low, not high, low. Um, forget the enemy fighters, forget the enemy defenses. Yes, the bombers will be in danger. But we're going to drop bombs from a lower altitude so they're more accurate. We're not going to drop explosives. We're going to drop napalm. Napalm is jellyfied gasoline. Um, so not only does it burn, it sticks. Um, you know, if you just throw gasoline up against a wall, it's just going to fall to the floor. Napalm sticks to whatever it hits, and then it just burns. And the thing is, the Japanese use a lot more wood in their construction. Um, you know, Tokyo back then, they were a few brick buildings, but most of them were made of wood. And so the idea was, even if you don't hit your target, you will start a fire that will eventually burn to your target and burn through your target. And so they, they changed their tactic. And um, there were a few issues with this. Um, for one, obviously, you were putting the bombers in danger by flying them lower. But Curtis LeMay, who had flown bomber missions in Europe, he had actually been there and done that. He was like, yeah, that's part of the job. The other issue, though, we're not even targeting the factory. We're just going to burn cities. We're going to burn civilians. We're going to indiscriminately just target civilians. Um, but Curtis LeMay took the stance of, you know, it's us or them. And, you know, you want to win the war? You got to do it. And they, they did. On March 9th, 1945, the first firebombing attack on Tokyo took place. Um, hundreds of B-29s dropped thousands of napalm explosives on Tokyo that night. It created a firestorm um, which killed, your book says, over 80,000 people. I've seen numbers that say upwards of 100,000 people that night. They either burned to death or they suffocated. They were asphyxiated. Um, they either choked to death basically on the smoke or there literally was no oxygen for them to breathe because the fire had sucked it all out of wherever they were. Um, we destroyed half of Tokyo. And in one night, we, we burned it down. By the end of June, we'd done this to a number of other cities. Um, by the end of the war, um, we had firebombed 67 Japanese cities, destroying over half of them, um, killing half the civilians in those cities. Uh, I'm not going to be able to play the clip for you. I'm not able to find it online. And I, I don't know how to, how to pull it off. But there was a, um, there was a documentary made in the early 2000s called The Fog of War, where they interview um, Robert McNamara, who served as the Secretary of Defense in the 1960s under John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, during World War II, he worked for Curtis LeMay. He was in the Army Air Force, and he was one of the men who proposed the fire bombings, etc. And he starts throwing down all these statistics and such about it. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting and informative. Um, but we were burning cities on a weekly basis, actually more than that, you know, um, to do that to 67 cities in the amount of time we did. But we we burned a number of Japanese cities to the ground and burned the civilians inside of them. Um, and still the Japanese wouldn't quit. So it looks like we're going to have to invade. Uh, it looks like we're going to have to go to Japan to win this war um, because the most intense and brutal bombing ever is not working, which is why we went to Okinawa. Just like we needed to launch the invasion of France from England, you know, you need to be close to launch an invasion. Again, it's why the Japanese never dreamed of actually invading California. How are you going to launch an invasion from Hawaii all the way to California? It's not possible. Um, you know, it's why you had an island hop, right? Well, Iwo Jima is too small and too far away to launch an invasion of Japan. So we're going to go to Okinawa. So we go from the Philippines um, to Okinawa. And the ideas from Okinawa will then be close enough to launch an invasion of Japan. Um, Okinawa is a fairly large island. And unlike Iwo Jima, which is just like a, you know, a scrap of volcano, um, Okinawa was actually Japanese. Um, there were Japanese civilians on Okinawa. There was, there was a population. As you can see, it's a fairly sizable island. And of course, it's more developed today than it was back then. But there were thousands of Japanese civilians, farmers, people. There were villages. There were towns, which is something uncommon for us. 
many of the places we'd attacked and invaded during the war um, had, had been like Iwo Jima or, or Tarawa, basically uninhabited. Um, or if they were, they were not inhabited by Japanese civilians. This is Japanese. It's been Japanese for decades. Um, and it was, again, another brutal fight. Um, we landed on uh, April 1st, 1945. Um, again, instead of defending the beaches, the Japanese dug in, in the hills, the mountains, the valleys. They made us fight for this island, not just the beaches. More than 12,000 American soldiers and sailors and marines died fighting, but on June 22nd, Okinawa had fallen. Um, the next stop is Japan at that point. Um, <clears throat> I do not have a chance to show it um, like I usually do. The one thing that was horrifying about the attack on Okinawa, too, again, those civilians, uh, we witnessed Japanese civilians commit suicide on Okinawa. Um, there's a famous, there's a few famous clips that were caught by combat photographers of Japanese civilians, um, women, jumping off cliffs to their deaths rather than surrender. Um, and there's one that's horrifying if you were to ever watch it, um, a Japanese woman throws her, her baby off the cliff first to make sure it, too, is killed and not captured. So we watched, um, I mean, we, we'd gotten used to kamikaze pilots and bonsai charges, you know, the soldiers. But then we saw the civilians do that. And we saw Japanese civilians kill themselves rather than surrender. And that really alarmed American commanders and politicians. What is it going to be like when we hit the beaches? You know, what's going to be like when we actually go to Japan? We desperately wanted them to surrender. And, and there were members of the Japanese government who were considering surrender, talking about surrender. Um, but they wouldn't. And it's because we wanted unconditional surrender. No strings attached, right? You surrender, you surrender. That's it. They had one condition, emperor. That was their one condition. They wanted a guarantee, a promise, a pledge from the United States that we would not remove the emperor, that we would allow them to keep their 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 um, their emperor on the throne. The emperor is a core value, or I should say was a core value of their culture. Um, the imperial throne of Japan can be traced back generation to generation to generation, over 100 generations. Um, over 100 generations have sat on that throne. Um, we can we can trace it all the way back to before the birth of Christ, actually. Um, historical figures, too, not mythical. I mean, if you want to go back to the mythical men, men of the throne, it goes back even further. But we can trace it back to B.C. Um, it is a it's part of the identity of these people. And they were definitely afraid that one of the things we would do if we won the war is remove the emperor. And, of course, that was their that was their one condition, and we were not going to do that. Um, President Truman, you know, he wanted to, to do it, but he knew he couldn't. The American people were angry. We wanted revenge. We blamed the emperor, obviously. They started at Pearl Harbor. The thought that the emperor didn't know about Pearl Harbor, no one believed that. Um, and so we could not give in to that condition. We had to fight unconditionally. Um, now, before we invade Japan, there is one last option. We had spent um, the last few years working on the Manhattan Project. In 1939, Leo Sulzard, one of the world's top physicists, um, had learned that the Germans had figured out how to split uranium. Um, Sulzard had actually written a paper about this and, and, and speculated on the possibility. And, and the big issue was the theory that splitting atoms would release enormous amounts of energy. Silzard, who was relatively unknown, um, told a good friend of his, Albert Einstein, a guy who was well known. And Albert Einstein is the man who wrote a letter to the president um, saying, I think that there's a lot of weapons potential here. He wasn't so much encouraging America to do it, but he said the Germans are working on it. <laughs> and obviously everyone took the thought of if the Germans get it first, they will use it. Right. And that is a threat to our safety and security. We were skeptical on it all, um, but eventually we started working on the Manhattan Project, which was the name we gave to our effort to build the world's, the world's first atomic bomb. Um, first, we had to figure out how to create a chain reaction and split atoms. Um, 
we built the world's first nuclear reactor um, in the University of Chicago gym under the bleachers. Most people don't know that the world's first nuclear reactor was was built under the the stands of a gymnasium. Um, once we got that, we kept going. Um, Robert Oppenheimer is actually J. Robert Robert Oppenheimer is the scientist that really headed the team. Albert Einstein wrote the letter. Oppenheimer was really the brains behind getting the Manhattan Project going and successful. On July 16th, 1945, the world's first atomic bomb was detonated um, in the deserts near Alamogordo, New Mexico. It was codenamed Trinity. This is a picture taken moments after the, the bomb detonated. It went off with a power of 20 kilotons, which means it had the explosive power equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT. Um, now, there was great debate in the administration. What do we do? Um, do we use this? Um, you know, for example, Secretary of War Henry Stimson, he said we should warn the Japanese about the bomb and offer to let them keep the emperor if they surrendered. Um, basically telling them we would let them keep their emperor, right? Don't, don't make it a condition, but just promise them we would. Um, just surrender, you know, or we'll do this. Some people said we need to drop the bomb without any warning to shock the enemy into surrender. Um, if you're curious, Harry Truman, he said he never really had a question. Um, he said it's a weapon. We've spent years and billions of dollars working on it. Why would we do all this if we're not going to use it? Also, the casualty figures were astounding. We were expecting to take horrific losses invading Japan. And Harry Truman knew that if we invaded Japan and we lost all those men, and the American people found out that we had this super weapon and we didn't use it. Instead, we sent their sons off to die in Japan. America, There's no telling how the American people would react. Fun fact, we have not made a Purple Heart since World War II. Why? Because the government made a bunch of Purple Hearts because they assumed we would need them for all the men killed and wounded in an invasion of Japan. Well, spoiler alert, we never invaded Japan. We have got thousands upon thousands of Purple Hearts in storage. Um, it's quite possible we'll never manufacture another Purple Heart. Uh, we have so many in storage because <laughs> the casualties were expected to be so bad. We expected the Japanese people to use suicide tactics against us. And so Harry Truman um, decided we would use the bomb. Um, we, we threatened the Japanese with prompt and utter destruction. We didn't tell them exactly, but we basically said surrender or else. And they did not reply. And that is when Harry Truman gave the order. Um, this is the actual order. This is on the USS Harry Truman. Uh, I hate to bore you with another picture from my uh, trip to the carrier, but there is a small museum on the USS Harry Truman for Harry Truman. And in it are several artifacts from his life and presidency. And this is one of them. This is the actual note that Harry Truman wrote to the Secretary of War authorizing the, you know, and it just says, um, you know, it's kind of coded, but your suggestion approved, release when ready. Um, but no sooner than August 7th. Um, excuse me, no sooner than August. Um, that's supposed to be August 2. Um, on August 6th, a B-29 named Enola Gay. Um the pilot in command, Mr. Paul Tibbetts, his mother was named, uh, he named it after his mother, um, Enola Gay, Enola Gay Tibbetts. Um, that plane flew over the city of Hiroshima and dropped um, a, an atomic bomb codenamed Little Boy. This is actually the bomb, 10 feet long, um, about 2 feet in diameter, weighed about 5 tons. Uh, this is the Enola Gay. Uh, it went off with a power of about 15 kilotons. It was a little a little weaker than the test bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico. The bomb destroyed 70,000 buildings. Um, it's hard to know who how many died. We'll never know. Um, and then you got to factor in how many died of radiation, cancer, and all these other good things. Um, this is a picture of the city before the blast. This is a picture after the blast. You see everything's wiped out. The city was obliterated. Um, Again, part of the reason we'll never know, people were vaporized. Um, this is a little bit of a weird thing to show, but 
This is what happens uh, with nuclear explosions. If people are very close to the actual explosion, um, there's a blinding flash um, and a blinding light. And it, it sun bleaches, right? It, it light bleaches stuff. Well, if a person is standing there, their body will actually create that shadow and block that light for that that millisecond or whatever. Well, it, it basically your shadow prevents the bleaching process. So these are found all over Hiroshima, at least they used to be, um, on any structures that were left. These were steps to a bank, stone steps. So there was a man with a cane either going up or going down these steps when the bomb went off and his shadow basically was burned into the into the ground um yeah the city was just wiped out in a blink and uh, the japanese of course were horrified um, but they didn't surrender so three days later um we we warned the japan or excuse me you know we warned the japanese the very next day we'll do it again if you don't surrender in three days Three days later, on August 9th, the Japanese did not surrender, so we sent another plane, this time one named Boxcar. Um, the actual B-29 Boxcar, you can go see it. It's at Wright-Patterson, the museum up in at Wright-Patterson, um, if you'd like to go see it. This is a picture of the replica bomb um, that is on display at Wright-Patterson. This was the real one, um, but this is what it looked like. And yes, it was painted that color. Um, for of uh, camera purpose uh, they could visually kind of guarantee that they saw the bomb falling um it was codenamed fat man that bomb hit the city of nagasaki um nagasaki has hills and such around it and the bomb was a little off course so it didn't create quite as much destruction but it still killed um well over 40,000 people. That same day, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Finally, at long last, the Soviets declared war and invaded Manchuria and Korea. Um, faced with the one-two punch of America wiping out cities in the blink of an eye and a Soviet invasion, um, the Japanese realized it was time to surrender. And the Japanese emperor said, we will surrender. We will take the shame. Um, I do want to point out, it's the Soviets, I think, as well as the bomb. Um, everyone knew what the Russians had done to the Germans when they invaded um, the the atrocities. I'm not going to go into them, but they they butchered the German people just the way the German people had butchered them when they invaded them. Um, and the Japanese, I think, were very fearful that if the Russians hit hit the shores of Japan, it was going to be a repeat. And they didn't want that. It would be better to surrender and, and take whatever deal is offered rather than to let the Red Army storm into Japan and um, kill and rape and destroy the way they did Germany. And so on August 15th, the Japanese surrendered. VJ Day, gentlemen. The war is over on August 15th. The Japanese officially surrendered on September 2nd. That's when we actually had the signing ceremony on the battleship USS Missouri, where the Japanese surrendered to the United States. Um, World War II was over. Now, before the war ended, President Roosevelt had actually talked about creating a new organization to, pre to prevent any future wars from occurring. This organization is going to be like a beefed-up, improved version of the League of Nations. It's going to be called the United Nations. Um, actually, the, the, the plan for this was created um, in 1944 at uh, Dunbarton Oaks Estate. Um, delegates from 39 countries got together and basically drafted the, the overall plan. The idea was there would be a general assembly where every country in the world would be represented. Um, one country, one vote, right? There would be what was called a security council that would focus on safety and security matters. There'd be 11 countries in that. Five would be permanent, and then they would rotate the other members in. The five permanent would be Britain, France, China, Soviet Union, United States, basically the big allied powers in World War II. The um, United Nations was actually born on April 25, 1945, right before the war in Europe ended, actually. Representatives from 50 countries came together to officially sign the charter or constitution that created the United Nations. Um, <clears throat> unlike the League of Nations, the United Nations has the ability to uh, use military force. Um, it's complex, but we learned some things from the League of Nations that sending letters that say, I'm disappointed in you, 
and and random economic sanctions didn't work. Um, uh, an organization with the ability to use some force might be necessary. So that's one change between the UN and the League of Nations. Um, one other thing about World War II before we look at the butchered bills, um, people were held accountable. Um, for example, the mil excuse me, the International Military Tribunal, the IMT, right, um, or the Nuremberg Trials. We created basically a system where we were going to try people for crimes against humanity for their conduct. The most famous are the Nuremberg trials. 22 surviving leaders of Nazi Germany were tried at the city of Nuremberg um, for their behavior. Um, not all were convicted. Three were actually acquitted. Um, seven were given prison sentences. The remaining 12 were sentenced to death by hanging. There were trials of all sorts of people. It wasn't just the big shots. Um, people that ran concentration camps, doctors that were found to have experimented on civilians, um, all sorts of people eventually were tried. And some were given executions, some were given life sentences, some were given 20 years, it varied. We had trials in Japan um, for various Japanese officials in World War II. You know, for example, the man who ordered the Bataan Death March, um, people that were found abusing prisoners. Um, 18 Japanese leaders were sentenced to death. Um, excuse me, were sentenced to prison. Um, many others were sentenced to death. Uh, fun fact, the emperor was not put on trial. Not that we thought the emperor was totally innocent. Um, we didn't want to indict the emperor. We feared that putting him on trial, the Japanese people might actually rebel. And we didn't want to put on, we didn't want to have to deal with trying to quash a rebellion in Japan. So the emperor was actually never put on trial. Um, but this was a this was a change. The idea that there are rules, and if you break them, um, you'll be held accountable. That the all's fair in love and war is not a valid statement. And I was just following orders. You know, for a lot of these men, that was their argument. Hey, Hitler told me, and I did it because I'm a soldier, and that's my job. There's the idea of valid versus invalid orders. Um, that was a new rub or new wrinkle. Although I would like to point out, and again. If we were in school, I would have that video, um, The Fog of War, where McNamara talks about, um, he said, he and Curtis LeMay have said to people, had America lost the war, he would have been a war criminal. He ordered the napalming of cities. He burned civilians. Um, you know, he's like, so what the Germans did is a war crime and what I did is victory. Uh, it's an interesting dichotomy and an issue to be taken. To wrap it up, let's just look at the let's just look at the bill. Um, if you look at percentage of national population, um, Poland lost uh, close to twenty percent, um, over eighteen percent of their pre-war population. Most of them civilians, thanks to the Holocaust. If you look at it, China lost almost twenty million people. Um, millions of soldiers and millions, more millions of civilians. As you can see, the Russians lost almost 11 million soldiers, and they lost another 13 million civilians. Almost 24 million Russians died in World War II. Um, as you can see, it was over 13% of their pre-war population. Um, as you can see here, even though not many Lithuanians died, Lithuania being a small country, um, these people being killed in the Holocaust, that represented 13% of their, 14% of their population. Um, enormous. That's what's interesting about World War II. Far more civilians died in World War II due to the Holocaust, what the Chinese um, suffered at the hands of the Japanese, etc., what the Russians suffered. Um, far more uh, Allied civilians died than anyone else in World War II. If you want to kind of just do a little breakdown from certain countries, some of you might notice this looks like your World Civ textbook. It is from your old World Civ textbook. Um, but you can see the financial costs, um, the military costs. It's just horrific, but it's over. And now we have to rebuild the world. Um, and that's not going to go as smoothly as we all want, as we will find out when we start covering Chapter 26, the Cold War. Um, but that is a story for another lecture.